Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are welcoming back our good friend Norman Solomon and talking in particular about the war in Gaza. Norman is co-founder and national director at RootsAction.org, where I also work, and he is the author of War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, just now out with a new afterword about the war on Gaza. Norman Solomon, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot, David. So tell us about this new afterword and what's invisible about the war on Gaza. Well, you know, what's invisible is unfortunately what is routinely invisible about wars that the United States is getting behind and making possible, you know, quite a contrast from the wars that the U.S. government says are bad, in which case we hear about the suffering of people uh, who are being championed as actual human beings, whereas when the U.S. government, as in this case, the war on Gaza, is assisting in the slaughter, there's a lot of fuzziness and vagueness and evasion about the humanity of people who are being killed and maimed courtesy of U.S. taxpayers. About a year ago, the hardcover edition of War Made Invisible was published, and then a few months later, uh, when last fall uh, the tragedies began to unfold with the slaughter of uh, Israelis by Hamas and then this ongoing war on Gaza got underway and continued, I began to think about what could I write for the paperback edition coming out uh, towards the end of 2024 that would be hopefully meaningful in terms of history. The saying goes that journalism is the first draft of history, and in mainstream corporate media, within which I include NPR and PBS, it's a slanted, distorted history that rarely gets corrected later on, and then later on, often it's too late to impact events. So when I imagined writing earlier this year about the Gaza conflagration. I hoped, of course, and at Roots Action and many other groups we work to try to bring about, I hoped that there would be an end of this uh, killing, this carnage in Gaza. But either way, I thought, well, I'll document the way in which U.S. news media and the political powers that be on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue or ends, uh, considering Foggy Baden at the State Department, all of these powers and forces in Washington were working with rare exceptions to continue the mass murder of largely children and women in Gaza. So I began to write last spring about the realities of how the actual circumstances were being you know, routinely distorted. And as I, I've written in this book, War Made Invisible, which goes to part of your question about what is invisible about the war, it's everything that the uh, mass media in the US and the political class of elites in this country think everything doesn't matter that it happened before. You know, history begins when we say it begins, which is what we have been getting in terms of message. So in the afterword for the paperback of War Made Invisible, I really worked from the outset to try to portray and bring to light what has been largely ignored in media, the decade after decade of apartheid uh, in Israel and in the occupied territories and the way in which Gaza has been, as has been called, an open-air prison and that October 7th and the horrific killing of Israelis by Hamas was a, albeit a totally wrong response, a response to decades of terrible oppression. And just to sort of sum up, the 
after it really goes into how genocide applies to what Israel has been doing to Palestinian people. And unfortunately, when the book went to press, and my hopes that by the time the book was published, it would be just history in the past. Very unfortunately, um, it's not in the past at all. It continues as we speak. It seems to me like there's a case someone could try to make that people have made this one a little more visible using independent media and social media and talking about it as a live streamed genocide as if people are seeing it and that polling even seems to reflect that somewhat and that activism you know insufficient dramatically insufficient as it is is greater than with some outrages uh because to some extent for some people it is visible but on the other hand i see corporate media i see political party conventions. I see a whole discussion around a presidential election that dominates all the media coverage as if nothing's happening in the world other than a presidential election for month after month. Uh, treat it really as not existing at all. Um, <laughs> which is it? Is it, is it becoming visible or, or less visible? The gap is larger than ever that I can remember in my lifetime between what people in the United States want overall, and the discourse and policies coming down and being perpetuated by the uh, political elites and the news media. I was surprised when I looked back at data on the Vietnam War that for most of it, young people, a majority of young people actually supported the war. And the change, the motor change came from mostly young activists being out and doing civil disobedience and protesting and agitating. So um, nonviolently, they were punching above their weight. So young people were extremely important in opposing the Vietnam War, but they were in a minority. Whereas in the last year, the polling is clear. Young people overwhelmingly oppose the Israeli war on Gaza and oppose the US support for that war. It's a, it's a split screen that is just uh, diametrically uh, contrasting where, as you say, largely because of the use of social media, not that technology in itself does anything, but the way that people, human beings have conveyed through words, images, empathy, organizing, what's at stake in human terms. On the ground, people are really uh, upset, empathetic, and uh, in opposition, sometimes very actively. Whereas, as you say, David, the Democratic and Republican conventions, most of what we're getting through mainstream media, certainly most of what's in Congress and coming out of the White House is just totally checked out. They're talking about a different world that doesn't exist, filled with euphemisms. And I think it that gets back to the matter of invisibility, because I write in the afterword about how even the conceit, the belief, the assumption that news media are conveying to us the essence of what's happening in the war on Gaza, that further distorts our capacity and undermines our capacity to understand what's involved. We have no clue really, other than flickering images and occasional um, good reporting, solid reporting, we have no clue. We're clueless about what it's really like to be in a war zone. And our uh, encouraged belief, encouraged by news media, that by tuning in to All Things Considered or Morning Edition or reading the New York Times, we somehow know what's going on. That's totally wrong. We are in a delusionary state if we think that the US news media are conveying to us the realities of the war that US taxpayers are literally making possible. Wasn't there, hasn't there been for the past couple of years, at least something of a limited exception in that 
we've been shown the victims of a war in Ukraine on one side, the Ukrainian side, and to some extent with October the 7th, uh, maybe even an exaggerated extent, we've been shown the horror and the suffering and the suffering of family members of, of victims as long as they were Israeli, not Palestinian. Uh, it, the, the, the trick would seem to be to apply what we're taught uh, through corporate media about Ukrainians and Israelis to Russians and Palestinians and everyone else around the world. We have a model of how wars could be covered in terms of connecting in human terms with what those wars really mean to people. And if you set aside the terrible political spin of the coverage from US news media of the war in Ukraine, then the model is there. The empathy, the connection, the suffering, the human uh, toll in many dimensions has been for more than two years now, really conveyed by US news media now, leaving out how NATO expanded up to Russia's border, the mendacity, the failure of efforts to have genuine diplomacy from NATO, from the West, from the US, set that aside, that spin has been uh, really extreme and distorting of history uh, and current history. Uh, so if we, for the moment, were to um, not focus on that, the actual human coverage of Ukraine has been showing what's possible. Problem is whether we get that kind of quality coverage depends on who's killing and who's being killed. And in the initial edition of War Made Invisible, I contrasted the US invasion of Iraq and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, a very extreme difference, very little empathy towards the Iraqi people who the US government was slaughtering beginning with the uh, US invasion in 2003. So you have those flip sides going on and something, uh, as you alluded to, very similar has been the case in the last nearly 12 months where the Israeli people who have been killed have been uh, the subjects of great empathetic coverage and perhaps if the 40,000 plus Palestinians, as I mentioned, most of them women and children, if they had been the subjects of similar in-depth empathetic coverage, maybe the war would be over by now because there would have been more understanding even in the US public about uh, just how horrific the war is and there could have been more pressure brought on the US government we would hope to uh, cut off the weapons. And uh, more than 80%, even when this war began, more than 80% of the weapons uh, Israel was importing was from the United States. And one more thing I'll mention, when there is empathetic coverage of Palestinians killed by the Israelis, often it's in the passive voice, they just, they were killed. Um, and often it's routinely, it's in, total lack of any context of how and why it's happening. It's victims without victimizers. Yes, very poignant, heart-rending features about individual Palestinians who are suffering, who've died, who are malnourished and starving. They're the victims, but it's as though it's uh, a uh, act of nature, act of God, uh, hurricane, tornado, and the victimizers don't come into focus. To the extent there's any clarity, it's Netanyahu, not even the ideology of Zionism that propels Israel as a whole. It's okay, it's that individual or the right-wing uh, government of Israel, which certainly should be condemned. But then what about the victimizers in the White House? What about the victimizers in Congress and the State Department, where we keep hearing about the rules-based order when they really mean we make the rules, we break the rules? Those victimizers rarely connected, rarely being connected in media coverage to those who are suffering on the ground in Gaza. Uh, 
Absolutely. I, I wonder if those casualty figures from Hamas may be significant undercounts, but I think uh, more important than the number would be telling the stories accurately and sympathetically for one or two people. Uh, we're speaking with Norman Solomon. The book now out in paperback with an afterword about Gaza is War Made Invisible. Um, Norman, you also wrote a great column recently about a guy named Hubert Humphrey um, making the wrong decisions for peace and for his own election um, and the parallels to now. Uh, can you explain that for people who, who didn't see it? The parallels are really stunning. And I think as the weeks go by, the election in November comes closer, even more stunning here we had in 1968, uh, a Democratic vice president who stepped into the nominating slot for election to the White House because the existing Democrat, uh, then in 1968, Lyndon Johnson decided to bow out. So many uh, decades later, we've had Biden bowing out, we've had Vice President Harris stepping up and a very unpopular war which uh, in the case of 1968 was crucial to why Johnson stepped down for re-election because he realized perhaps he couldn't even win. Uh, the war was so unpopular. So here we are uh, heading towards the 2024 election. And just as in 1968, the uh, vice president cannot bring, in this case, herself, to distance from the war policies of the president. And it's excruciating to read about how Humphrey was torn. It was you know, like the angel and devil on his shoulders, so to speak. He could not quite bring himself to break away from and criticize the war policy in Vietnam, the terrible uh, slaughter on massive scale going on, because he was afraid that he would anger uh, President Johnson. And here, and the latest reporting is that we're getting, and uh, clearly from what she's saying and not saying, Kamala Harris is just unwilling to say what most voters in this country by a clear majority want, which is we should cut off all weapons to Israel. And that is the position as long as the carnage goes on. And I keep coming back to that carnage is underwritten and literally made possible by U.S. taxpayers and the Congress and President of the United States. And that is a fact that is very rarely made as a fine point by U.S. media. That's another form of invisibility. It's back to the victims without victimizers. One one way for people to learn more would be for there to be educational opportunities outside of the corporate media. And I know one thing that that Roots Action Education Fund is working on is setting up teach-ins, uh, something that uh, has echoes uh, from the era of the 60s as well. Um, can you talk about this new teach-in network? It's really a, an organized way to say that students and the rest of us for that matter, we need knowledge and we need power. And it's as this fall term unfolds, very clear that the many of the college presidents, the boards of trustees and big donors, they don't want students to have really in-depth, clear knowledge of the roots of this slaughter in Gaza and increasingly in the West Bank. And they certainly don't want students who are motivated to change the US policies to have power. And the New York Times, for instance, has reported that these uh, college officials, they're still somewhat freaked out. They're on their heels. They didn't expect the nonviolent, powerful uprising that resulted in thousands of arrests on campuses this spring. So the teaching network, which has just launched, is an organized way to help facilitate, to bring about, and to strengthen what we believe will be hundreds and hundreds of teachings around the country. And uh, you and I are involved at Roots Action Education Fund to sponsor this teaching network. And I really invite everybody, 
to go to the site and sign up so you can be part of this, what I think will be a historic effort. And that's simply teachinnetwork.org. Teachinnetwork.org. Uh, sounds great. I know some some students are back already and are active again already. Um, and uh, we've seen some successes, some universities divesting, some city councils divesting from weapons or at least uh, weapons companies that are involved with Israel, which includes all the big major weapons companies. Uh, so it's actually a way to get divestment from, from all military engagement uh, without calling it that, uh, with reference to one very unpopular war. Um, is this something that, that students will keep pushing for, or what, what are students after uh, at these campuses? Well, there's really a variety of demands, I think, cut off of uh, weapons shipments to Israel. There's also the demand for a ceasefire, which it's, it's so tragic that we're still needing to make that demand. And I think there are increasingly some broader and deeper demands for a challenge to US militarism generally. And one of the things that really struck me as I tried to figure out the, with the subtitle of the War Made Invisible book, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. As I worked on this afterward for the paperback, I thought, how does the military machine of the United States connect to the Israel Defense Forces? And something jumped out. Well, we have something called the Defense Department here. We have the Israel Defense Forces. They are uh, misnomers, to put it mildly. They're Orwellian, very little of what they do has anything to do with defense whatsoever. And it eventually really struck me that the Israeli military and the US military machine are gears that are very meshed together. The Israeli military is an adjunct to the US military, by far the most powerful and expensive in the world. So we really have uh, two military machines that are in a large way the same military machine. And even though there's a different command structure uh, of the IDF, in some, in terms of how they operate, share intelligence, share weapons, share data about how the weapons function, they are the same entity in terms of how they slaughter in the Middle East, not only in the West Bank and Gaza, but in Lebanon and elsewhere. And also the geopolitical goals involved because as President Biden and others have said for decades, Israel and the United States help each other, they defend each other, they're part of the same apparatus in terms of their policies and how they actually operate. Do you think when somebody like Joe Biden or many other members of the US government claims to be trying to engineer a ceasefire. Uh, one more, the final push for a ceasefire, which follows the former uh, final push for the ceasefire, which follows the you know, earlier, you know, do you think there's any sincerity there? Do you think there's such an unfathomable degree of stupidity that they believe they can provide unlimited weapons and simultaneously actually effectively ensure a ceasefire, whatever that might mean, or, or are, they, are they simply lying like usual? The mentalities uh, vary because they're different people, but I think they're working in the same milieu that ends up being a sort of a bubble. They're on priorities. They believe in the primacy and the right and duty of the United States to dominate and work its will in as much of the world as possible. Um, the late Edward Herman, who wrote with Noam Chomsky, Manufacturing Consent, used to say that there's no such thing as a sincere ometer. There's no way to measure somebody's internal sincerity. But I would say that if we actually look at their behavior, what these policymakers end up doing, there's such a fundamental Orwellian contradiction between what they claim to believe in, uh, democracy and protecting civilians and so forth, and what they actually do. And it's that 
kind of chronic contradiction that propels people, whether they're students or anybody else, in opposition to the warfare state, propels us to say, we're not going to intellectually or morally be compromised because of the nonsense that keeps being spewed out by people in power. Good idea. Uh, Norman Solomon, we got three or four minutes left. Uh, what else should people be doing and what else is Roots Action doing and where can people contact you and follow your work? A lot of, I think, the challenge for uh, people who want to create a world without systemic violence and injustice and so forth is that we need to find ways to mobilize politically. Certainly at rootsaction.org, after a dozen years or so, we developed a lot of relationships and mechanisms for people to organize within and outside of the lobbying and electoral arenas. And so certainly invite everybody, if you're not already getting action alerts, do go to rootsaction.org. You can about 30 seconds sign up with your email address and your zip code. And we can uh, tap you in with a lot of other people with similar, not only values, which has become sort of a political buzzword, but action that we can take action together. And to me, part of what's needed is to get away from deferring to elected officials, members of Congress, and uh, for that matter, the president. But often I find people are overly polite, you might say, and give the benefits of doubts to their particular Congress people. And no matter how you feel about those folks, they work for us. You know, we're not supposed to be working for them. And at Roots Action, we're very multi-issue. So if people go to rootsaction.org, you'll see that whatever your major issues are, what your major concerns are, there are ways that you can get engaged and really make a difference. There's a saying that no matter what your first issue of concern is, your second concern ought to be media because it's ways for us to communicate with each other or ways that we are shielded from information we need. And it's really dawned on me as the years have gone by that as Roots Action sends out email alerts and there are other ways to reach people, among other things, along with being an activist organization, we're a de facto media outlet as well because we're about communication and communication that's it's not really vertical, but it's horizontal. How can we communicate with each other about facts, human realities, political power, and most of all, what we can do about it? And that reminds me to mention the ongoing outlet that Roots Action has, Progressive Hub. And I would encourage people, get in the habit of visiting progressivehub.net. It's a way to not only get information, but literally on every page of an article, you will see an action box where in a matter of a minute or so, you can respond to the problem by reaching a, an elected official or a prison warden or someone else and organizing effectively. So it's, here's the problem, let's take action to solve it. Perfect, we've been speaking with Norman Solomon, the book now in paperback, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine by our guest Norman Solomon with a new afterword on the Gaza War. Norman, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.